Hey, this is Ike. Got a 25 cent, 50 cent video for you today. Got some interesting hands right off the bat, so I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, I 3-bet uh, Sick V's hijack open with the King Jack there. And I'll get back to that in just a minute. But I'm folding this 4-5 suited on the button against that under the gun open. Normally that would be a call, but with short stacks in both the blinds, I think I'm getting shoved on probably in the neighborhood of 20% of the time, maybe even more. After I call, there's going to be a shove behind me, and I just think that makes the hand unprofitable. With a better suited connector, like 8-9 suited, 9-10 suited, I'd probably call anyway. But with a more marginal hand, I think that it becomes a fold because of the short stacks and the blinds there. Uh, getting back to the King-Jack 3-bet, I like the 3-bet there because it's a pretty strong hand, but not quite strong enough for me to be excited about calling it against an unknown there. Especially because he's a little bit less than full stacked, that makes my positional advantage a bit less and makes calling even less appealing, though I would be 3-betting rather than calling against an unknown there, even if he did have a full stack. Um, calling wouldn't be a disaster, I think you probably do show a, prop, a very slight profit for a call there if you play it well post-flop, but you're going to be in tough situations against an unknown, much more so than in a 3-bet pot, because in a 3-bet pot, if he 4-bets, we just fold. If he calls, we just pretty much go with top pair and on the flop, uh, and maybe C-bet bluff some boards, probably mostly check it back if we're called and miss the flop. I like the 3-bet both because well, I think the 3-bet just as a bluff preflop probably shows a profit against the range with which most people are opening there and then the range with which they're playing against the 3-bet. I'm just going to take it down often enough to show a profit. But then King-Jack is a hand that plays pretty well post-flop if I do happen to get called in that spot. So I'm 3-betting sick V with king Do suited again here. It's definitely toward the very bottom of the hands I'd consider 3-betting with in a spot like this, but I actually think it's a favorable spot to be 3-betting again because of the fact that I 3-bet him last orbit, and sometimes I like to just sort of pick a fight with a player who I've got position on and hope that they'll overreact to my aggression and sort of spew against me. I mean, he shoved on my raise here, and obviously that's not good because I don't have it this time, but... If there's anybody who's likely to take it personal that you're playing against, playing hard against them, it's the guy with 60 big blinds and a vampire face avatar. So, I'm going to pick a bit of a fight with Sikvi in this video, and we'll see how that works out. Today's video is the second part of a series that I'm now working on. My last video was at 10 cent, 25 cent. This one's at 25.50 and I'm going to be moving up through the limits until I get to at least 510 or 1020. I might throw in 2550 also. But in any case, I'm going to be doing a series moving up through all of the limits and talking about how the opposition changes and how you should change your play to account for that. So I'm going to be trying to focus on the differences between this game and the 10 cent, 25 cent game I was playing in last week. If you watched that last video, you'll remember that one of the biggest things I was talking about was attacking limpers, and an opportunity to do exactly that is coming up right now, but it was several minutes into the video before it did. I raised the A7 suited behind the hijack limper. He calls. Got a favorable flop, because I've got a gut shot and an over, and it's pretty dry board, so I continuation bet it. He calls. I turned the ace, and now I'm just happy to get the stack in. River the straight, even happier to get the stack in. But I was bet folding on the flop. I was betting intending to fold if he raised. Then once I turned top pair, I was betting turn intending to get it in if he raised. And then, obviously, I was shoving River for value there after I made the straight. Pretty straightforward hand. No real decisions on any street, I think. I think it would have been a mistake to do anything differently on any street there, including limping as opposed to raising preflop with the a7 suited in the small blind there. If it was unsuited, I think it would be reasonable to just call, though I still prefer a raise. Um, yeah, I would have been raising 
any ace whatsoever there. And really a wide range of suited hands, wide range of two big card hands. I still, even though we're playing bigger stakes this time, definitely still all about attacking the limpers with a very wide range. The reason that I'm going to be raising behind limpers a lot less in this video than in the last one is not that I'm any more reluctant to do so at these stakes, it's that the situations don't come up as much. And of course I'm going to be attacking limpers even more aggressively when I have position than when I don't, so in that hand where I just raised the king four suited, my range to raise behind those limps would probably have been roughly any two suited, any two cards seven or higher. So much more than half of the possible hands I could be dealt there I'm raising when the hijack can cut off both limp. I'm going to pause the video for a second here because i got two interesting hands going at once. This ace-king hand, he raises the flop. His range here is probably entirely trips or bluff, so I don't think there's much value in me three-betting because I'm never going to get it in against worse without enough history to expect the guy to bluff four bet me here against my three bet so I'm just gonna call and I'm gonna check any turn tending to call and probably just call it down if he were to fire all three barrels if turn goes check check I might put in a little value bet on the river it's kind of a tough spot it's hard for me to get money out of worse hands here because it's such a dry board but I think that's the way to play it anyway Onto this king-queen hand here. I'm not all that pleased with how I played this. I think I missed an opportunity to make a really good play with the king-queen there by raising to three rather than two preflop. If I'd raised two preflop there, that's a raise of 150, and then when cuz 81 moves in, he's raising 185 more, reopening the action, and I can re-raise and force sick V out and neglecting to take that into account I think was a mistake. It would have been much better to raise to two preflop so that I could reopen the action when it got back to me if cuz 81 shoved. I think that's a play that people, myself included, miss all the time, taking into account the short stack size and whether or not you're going to be able to reopen the action against his push. I think it comes up in tournaments actually even more than in cash games. People don't really fail to pay attention to it there also. But so that was the main point of interest in that hand. I think th their limping ranges are weak enough that it's a clear open behind them. And that I missed an opportunity to make a really good play by making it two instead of three there. But oh well. And then, of course, the flop was great for me, and I bet, hoping to get it in, I think it's easy to see Sikvi getting it in with a worse top pair, or second pair in a draw, or even just, like, ace-jack with a diamond or something like that. So, I think that betting the flop there was definitely correct. And now, three bet those nines against Sikvi, hoping to get it in, because, like I was saying earlier, sort of trying to pick a fight with him and 3-bet the aces. I could have flatted the aces there, but there are relatively tight players behind me who I don't think are especially likely to 3-bet, which is one of the biggest things I'm looking for when I do decide to flat aces rather than 3-bet them, is a situation where somebody else is likely to put in the 3-bet for me. So, went ahead and made the standard play, and 3-bet the aces. Going back to the nines against Sick V, um, I would, as a default, call those against most players, but between the history we've already developed, me three banging him a couple times in the relatively short time we've been at the table, and him shoving on me and taking it down once, I think that I can three bet for value, hoping to get it in a little bit wider than I normally would. Against a hundred big blind unknown from the button, I'd be flatting nines almost every time, and flatting tens a good bit. 3-betting jacks just about every time. Against a 60 big blind unknown, I'd probably be 3-betting the 10s more often than not, 
but still flatting the nines mostly. But I think that the history with sick V moves nines and maybe even eights into the three bet and hope to get it in range. Now with this ace nine here against the button open, I think calling is the right play by a lot. Hand plays pretty well post flop, especially with only about two bets to go in. I can flop top pair and be quite happy to get it in. Internet connection cut out for a second here. Sorry about this. Um, didn't end up making me fold any hands, though it should be coming back in just a second. Yeah, there it goes. So, it sat me out at a couple tables, but... Got to play the ace-9 still. Now, this is a kind of interesting spot with the ace-9 here. I can either check-raise all in, or I can lead out. The benefits of check-raising all in are that he is going to c-bet a bunch of his misses, and then fold to the shove, and I get the continuation bet off of him. Whereas, against... Whereas if I lead out, he's probably going to fold a lot more hands without getting an opportunity to put any money at all in. But on the other hand, if he does want to take a stab at the pot and bluff with one of his misses, he's going to have to shove it over my lead rather than just betting. So he's putting in 15 rather than probably something in the neighborhood of 250 or 3. So he only needs to bluff shove a fifth as often as he would see bet for me to make as much money off of his total air by leading out as I do by checking. And I think by leading, I still get to stack an ace every time. I don't see how he does anything other than call my flop bet and call my turn shove if he has an ace here. And I think he'll probably just shove any flush draw if I lead into him. Whereas if I check, he might check behind with the flush draw. He might actually flat call a flop bet with the flush draw and then fold to the turn bet, which wouldn't be great. I would certainly prefer that he raise it all in. I would actually even prefer that he bet the flop and then fold to the shove relative to calling the flop bet intending to fold if he misses on the turn. But I think the thing he most often does with the flush draw is shove it over the lead here. So all in all, I think that leading is better than checking with these stacks on this board. And I lead out. And he mucks. So it didn't work out there, and it's very likely that I make three bucks by checking it to him and shoving over his bet if he was going to see bet with something like... No way I know what he had there, but like, total miss, like 8-7 or queen-10 or whatever. Good chance he bets those hands once and then folds to the shove. So I definitely do lose out on that by betting rather than checking. Now, very loose player limp the button. I'm going to raise him up with 6-7 off. And again over here, another chance to attack limpers with the ace-9. That's not a particularly favorable flop for my 6-7, but I'm going to bet it anyway. I have a pair. I'm drawing to two pair of trips. Weird turn, also. Good for a lot of his hands, but also it does give me the kind of crummy flush and straight draws now. So I'm going to keep betting. I'd be intending to fold to a raise here. I'm also intending to shove most rivers if I get flat called, because if I get called again on that board rather than raised all in. I think it's very likely that a weak player has a hand like 10-9, jack-9, um, some weakish pair with a random club, things like that. They're going to call one barrel and hope to improve, and then when they miss on the river are going to fold. So I was busy with the 6-7 hand and kind of neglected this ace-9 that was going on on the other table, and that hand went rather nicely for me. I raised it up pre-flop and got called by the first limper and also the small blind, and then got a pretty unfavorable flop, but see betted anyhow, because the under-the-gun limper is just so loose that he has two undercards to that king-jack board a lot of the time, and I think it's right for me to try to take it down there. And then he called the flop bet with the uh, flush draw and just checked it down and let my ace high win, so bit of a lucky win there. And this 
queen 10 off 3 bet here. This is a play I make a lot and really like. I like 3 betting against a raise and a cold call with two big cards because, well, it's a standard squeeze spot and 3 betting there in general is good and I think that 3 betting there specifically with two Broadway cards is especially good because they play well in 3 bet pots against one opponent and play very poorly called out of position against multiple opponents because in the first case a top pair hand is very strong and in the second case top pair hands are not very strong at all so you can manipulate the situation to make it a good one for your hand by 3 betting with the two Broadway hands and spots like that anyway I got called by the one player the original opener and pretty dry flop. I made an interesting decision there by deciding to bet quarter pot or third pot on the flop when there's only a little more than a pot size bet left to play. I think that that line is better than just shoving or than check folding. I think that any bet size is better than check folding because we're going to take it down enough of the time. But I think that the smaller bet there is good for two reasons. First of all, I think that if this guy shoves, he's got me crushed, and I get to make a good fold. And he's going to shove roughly the same range against that bet that he would call against the pot size shove, a little bigger than pot size shove. I think that I get slightly more folds by just shoving it there, but that it's outweighed by the benefit of getting to make a good fold when he pushes on me with the under bet. And then the second benefit of the underbet is that a weak player is just going to call that underbet intending to fold the turn a lot with, like, ace highs, maybe even weak pairs. So if he just calls the flop bet, I think I actually have a very profitable push on a lot of turns for another 15 into the pot of now, 22. So I think that's a line a lot of people would not think to take that works out very well in that spot. And while we're on the topic of weird bet sizing, in particular weird bet sizing in 3-bet pots, it's important if you're going to start doing things like that, that you make sure to make those under bets with both value bets and with bluffs, or you'll be turning your hand face up to your more observant opponents. This ace-king suited hand here is actually surprisingly tricky, because the under-the-gun raiser is so tight over a very small sample but still, 6-3 is real tight. It may actually have been right to just call the ace-king suited there rather than 3-bet it. Against almost any player, I 3-bet it and get it in really happily. And even against somebody this tight, once he's 4-bet, I'm certainly stacking off with the ace-king suited. It's correct for me to stack off the ace-king suited. Only by a little bit, but still correct. Based on the price I'm getting, even if he's jacks plus ace-king and never ever folding after he 4-bets, which is probably pretty believable that he is. So if he's legitimately a 6-3, I definitely should have just flatted it rather than 3-betting, but if his actual stats are, you know, a bit more than double that if he's really like a 15-8 or something and he's opening under the gun with like 6% of his hands. I'm still getting enough folds pre-flop, I think, that it's correct for me to just stack off the ace-king. But maybe not. Maybe at that point it becomes just barely profitable for me to stack off the ace-king and I'd prefer to call it. Yeah, I think so. I think he has to be actually playing fully three times as many hands as my stats say he is for it to be right for me to three bet there. I think I might have made a mistake in that hand. It's so hard to tell when you have 35 hands against somebody and they're playing 6-3 though what you should determine that their actual stats probably are. Because nobody really plays 6-3. But I guess there's a wider variation of 
how loose and tight people are in these lower stakes games, and that maybe there are a few people who are playing, legitimately playing that tight. It's hard to say, I'm really not sure. That's actually a point that it would be really great for me to get some feedback from you guys who play these games more often on. What do you guys think when you have 35 hands against somebody and he's playing that tight? Are there a lot of people in these games who are genuinely playing close to that tight? Or do you assume that it's just an aberration and that probably after 150 hands he'll be playing relatively more normal stats? I just don't have the experience in these games to know make a good forum discussion topic if some of you guys have opinions on that issue. Now this ace-queen suited 3-bet against sick v. This is sort of one of the situations I've been working towards with all those 3-bets I've been putting on him. been hoping to get in a spot to 3-bet him with a really strong hand in position. Getting called and then seeing that flop is not what I was looking for on the other hand, though. It's a really tricky spot. Just check it back. Hit top pair on the turn, now I'm going with it. I beat a lot of hands here. He can have, you know, king queen, king jack, king ten, with or without a heart. Or he can even be just pure bluffing with crap here, and I take it down with my shove. So yeah, I think I can get it in ahead here. I think that I take it down with my shove a lot. Or the alternative is that he actually just flopped the nuts and I lose. But especially with the jack and ten of hearts on that board, it's relatively unlikely that he has... I mean, certainly he still has many, many possible ways to have a flush, but the presence of the jack and the ten of hearts there makes it considerably less likely that he has the flush. So, I'm definitely happy with how I played the hand. I guess we can count that as a bit of a cooler. Not too interesting of a spot with the ace-queen suited there. The decision to 3-bet rather than call against that relatively tight opener I guess a bit tricky. Um, I mean, he's not tight at all. He's 56. But the 6% raising is a pretty tight open. But on the other hand, he's so loose and passive that he's probably calling the re-raise with everything he opens with, including lots of relatively weak hands, and then playing poorly out of position post-flop. So I just want to isolate him and play in position with the ace-queen suited against him. Even if it's not way, way ahead of his range. It's still a favorable spot, because I have position. He's a weak passive player. Now this is a weird spot with the six suited here. He min re-raised me. Can't fold the min re-raise. It's probably a very strong range that he's doing it with. I flop middle pair. There doesn't seem to be much point in betting. He rarely has a whole lot of outs if he's behind. If he's behind, he's likely to have some sort of ace. I'm behind a decent amount. Now he pots the turn after the flop goes check, check. I call. Um, I think that... That's a bluff a decent amount. And... Now he half pots the river. This is a tough spot. As you can tell, I thought about it a while at the time. But... I think that people actually fold too much in spots like this. Pause for a second while I talk about it. People really hate being wrong with river calls and tend to just think about whether or not the other guy has it rather than looking at the price they're getting. Here I'm getting nearly 3 to 1. I only need to win a quarter of the time for calling to be correct. So, people tend to really beat themselves up when they call in a spot like this and get shown a strong hand, but 
I don't think that's justified. I think that people are actually causing themselves to play worse by getting so worked up about making bad river calls in spots like this, and that you get shown weird hands more than you would expect when somebody min re-raises and then takes kind of suspect line post-flop. A lot of the time it's exactly what it looks like. It's a weak player trying to play a really strong hand in a way that they don't give you an opportunity to fold, but sometimes they'll be sort of feigning that same line and actually have junk here or even show up with something really strange like ace-5 or pocket fours or something like that. So I went ahead and called. Sure enough, he showed me kings, so... I don't know. It's one of those spots where their line is really confusing, and if there's anywhere I should have folded, it's probably the turn, actually. The full pop bet on the turn is pretty weird. I deviated a bit from how I normally play that 4-6 suited by limping it pre-flop, but I think that there are a lot of good reasons to limp rather than raise behind those two particular limpers. Sick V is... We've sort of been going back and forth a lot. He seems willing to play back at me pretty light, so he's not particularly desirable to isolate relative to a more loose passive player. And then secondly, this guy all in LSI has been overbet shoving preflop a lot and playing tight and I think it's pretty likely that if I raise and it's folded back around to him he's just gonna stick it in with whatever he happens to have there he's not limping in very loose and he's quite willing to get his stack in and obviously I can't call with the 6-4 suited so I think that that was a good spot to mix things up and just limp in behind some limpers rather than raise if I had had, I don't know, I actually probably would have limped some very strong hands there. I would have needed a uh, medium pair, ace-jack, maybe ace-ten, uh, king-queen, king-jack, something like that to raise. I really would have been in that spot limping in most of my medium strength hands. As a poker player, it can be easy to get in a rhythm where you just look at a spot like that and make the routine play, especially when you're playing long sessions, playing a lot of tables. It's easy to just sort of make the default play there and make a mistake. And it's important to be keeping in mind why you're making the plays you're making so that you can identify when spots where you should deviate from what you normally do come up. Like, I'm raising weak limpers with weak hands in spots like that because I'm hoping that... Let me pause for a second here. I'm hoping that I'll get I'll either win it pre-flop or I'll get called and they'll check fold the flop. That's basically why those plays are profitable. Sure, other things happen sometimes that work out well for me too, but mainly raising those limpers is good because you're either going to take it down pre-flop or they're going to call and check fold the flop. And against the particular limpers who were in the hand there, that just wasn't going to happen very much, I don't think. So raising would not have accomplished what it was supposed to and would have been a mistake. Anyway, now this jack-9 hand is a bit interesting. Um, I decided to 3-bet this guy here, because jack nine's pretty good. I've got position. He's loose and passive, so it should work out well. And then I get shoved on by the short stack and the big blind, and I'm priced in. Uh, it looks pretty awful to 3-bet and call a 4-bet with uh, jack-9 off, but nothing I can do there. I'm getting like 4 to 1. Practically priced in if he showed me aces. So, plays like that can end up being really good for your image when you end up getting all in preflop with some ridiculous garbage hand. And that 8-5 suited I just folded in the upper right 
Earlier in the session, I probably would have 3-bet Sikvi with that, but I think right now the dynamic has shifted so that I want to be 3-betting him mostly with very strong hands and holding back on the bluff 3-bets. Rather, when I say very strong hands, I'd be probably 3-betting him with Ace-Jack off there. Uh, not very strong hands, but hands that I'm trying to play for value. I'm not 3-betting hoping to win it pre-flop, because he already showed me he's willing to call my 3-bets with hands as weak as Ace-5 suited, so I really need to be 3-betting him with hands that I'm happy to play flops against him with now, and 8-5 suited does not qualify. Again, that check behind on the flop against him there is definitely a little bit out of the ordinary for how I play in general, but specifically against him, I think I'm getting check raised a ton on that board, and that I need to check behind against him with some hands some of the time there, and a good ace high with no draws is exactly the sort of hand that's good for that, because I can check it down and win, I'm not worried about missing value by betting and getting called by worse hands. Not worried about missing the opportunity to bluff out better hands, because no better hands are folding. So it's a perfect spot to slow down, check it down, and hope to win. And then, as it worked out, a bad card came off on the turn, and I had just fold to his lead. This queen 10 spot's a bit of a mess. I ended up just folding, but definitely make an argument for calling again there. I just don't know the player at all. Uh, the flop call, I think, is pretty standard. I think I'm happy with making that call there. An interesting alternative there would be to raise the flop and turn the hand into a semi-bluff, but that's something I'd rather do against an opponent I knew a bit better, I think. I think just check calling one street and check folding the next. No fun, but it seems like the thing to do. That seven's hand is kind of awkward. I don't really know what to put him on when he leads out there, but it's been my experience that when, especially pretty weak players, but even pretty strong players, when they lead into you in a spot where they can be pretty certain you were going to bet if they check to you, and I do bet that spot when checked to with just about any hand, and it seems like he would expect me to, is the preflop raiser there. When somebody, rather than checking to you, goes ahead and bets into you there, they almost always are either bluffing or doing something weird with some other mediocre hand that is not willing to call a raise and get the stack in. So, I don't know if I'm trying to get him to fold like a bad jack there, or a gut shot, or if he just has ace high or something like that, but I simply win the pot by raising so often there that I'm gonna go ahead and go against my usual rules of knowing exactly what I'm putting my opponent on why I'm doing what I'm doing and just raise it up and win the pot in that spot. It also doesn't hurt that there's a third player behind me. It doesn't hurt in terms of making it a raise over a call. It's certainly not a fold no matter what, but it helps the case for raising rather than calling that there's a player behind me who can potentially even fold a jack there to bet and raise on the flop. And hold on, I'm going to pause and discuss that atrocity of a 7-5 hand that just happened there. I just got owned by the grinning Scandinavian kid. Um, I really don't know what he was doing there. Um, my thinking when I decided to raise the river was that he had check called the turn with something like a nine or a bad jack and was then betting less than a third pot on the river as sort of a block bet there, hoping that you know, Maybe I call with ace high, maybe I call with a bad nine. Uh, well, I guess it doesn't matter what kind of nine it is, the kicker's not going to play there. Unless it's an ace or a king. Um, but, yeah, 
yeah, I guess I was putting him on a uh, hand worse than a pair of queens here that was betting small as a block bet and hoping that with a big raise I could take it down. And then when he shoved on me, I'm not quite sure what to put him on now. Maybe as little as two pair, maybe he called the turn with queen jack or queen nine and rivered the two pair and decided to bet small and then shove over my raise. But that seems like a weird shove rather than call because so much of the range he's getting that I'm going to raise and then call the re-raise with is trips, hands like ace two. So it seems wrong, though it, that doesn't necessarily rule out the possibility of him doing it. It seems wrong for him to be value three betting two pair on the river. So I f guess the most likely scenario is either that he was shoving as a bluff, in which case I still can't call because I play the board, but, um, yeah, either that the three bet all in was a bluff, or that he had something like 10 8 or king 10 of hearts, or maybe even king 10 of not hearts, that made a straight on the river. I, or he could have slow played a set, played a set like that, or quads, I guess. It's really hard for me to put him on a hand there. I really don't know why he played the hand the way he did or what he was likely to have there. But sure worked out better for him than it did for me. So I'm going to wrap up the video now. Um, it's been a pretty good session. Played a lot of interesting hands. In keeping with the theme of this series, I just want to talk a little bit before I go about how my play in the 25 cent, 50 cent game differed from my play in the 10 cent, 25 cent game you saw last week. And, I mean, it's obvious that I was playing a lot tighter in this game than I was in the last one. I was playing a lot fewer hands. But the thing that is a little less obvious is that I wasn't really making a lot of tighter decisions. I wasn't when presented with the same situations playing differently. I was being presented with a lot fewer favorable situations. And that's something that I think people don't understand so much about the point about of playing tighter as you move up. It's not that it becomes right to play tighter to make different decisions in the same spots as you move up. It's that against tougher opponents you are given fewer profitable opportunities. You are less often put in the spots where it's right to play your hand, and you're more often put in the spots where it's right to not play your hand. So, I think that's one of the biggest lessons from this video, is that as you move up and play in tougher games, you do play tighter, but it's not because you're passing up on spots that you would have been happy to play in the past. It's because you're getting fewer good spots to play your hand. So, that's all I've got for today. Hope you enjoyed the video. Post your comments in the forums, and good luck in all your games.